The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. So I would like at this time to have um, my grandson and his mother and father come forward, and I, if I could have the witnesses come. So this is Jason, our son, Gwen, his wife, and this is baby Landon, Landon William Harding Clark, born April 1st, and Charlene and Shane, and this is Haven, Landon's sister. So. Okay, you know, this is uh, to be addressing the parents here, Jason and Gwen Clark, Landon William Harding Clark, the charge to the parents, Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit down at home, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. It is the command of God that we should diligently seek to raise the children in such a way to lead them to trust Christ as Savior and to serve him as Lord. In response to this command, these parents bring their child today uh, to, pre to present them to the Lord and dedicate themselves to this task. The precedent for child dedication may be found in Scripture, 1 Samuel 1.28, Hannah presented Samuel and gave him to the Lord. Also, the presentation of Jesus himself by Joseph and Mary in Luke 2.22. And Jesus considered children to be infinitely precious. And in Mark 10.14, he said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to these. Now the purpose of dedicating a child is really to be found in the purpose of parents. Rightly understood, this ceremony is actually one of presenting Landon to the Lord, of course, but also one of parental dedication to this cause. These parents, Jason and Gwen, are pledging themselves to obey the command of Paul who in Ephesians 4.4 4, tells parents to bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Nurture and admonition of the Lord. I think sometimes we use these phrases over and over again and we fail to, to recognize what they really mean. But I'm going to ask them in advance. Do you, Jason and Gwen, promise to raise this child in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? We do. And with that, I want to share five heart attitudes that are absolutely necessary in understanding when we say raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, I believe it's a life message, a heart attitude. Children watch your behavior as parents. So this is, this is a firm uh, commitment by the parents who will say this, that number one, I'm going to exemplify church attendance, forsaking not the assembling, because what you take lightly, they will take even more lightly. Where you compromise in your life message. I was raised where my dad dropped me off the church and went home. That doesn't work well, does it? No. Your life message as a parent, whatever you compromise, they will take to excess. And these are the elements that you need to have in your heart. That church attendance is important, not forsaking the assembly. Secondly, you teach them to serve. We have many people who want to be leaders, but they've never served. You can't be a leader until you serve, and then when you lead, you are a servant leader. The third element, tithing. Your attitude toward finances and tithing. When they see that the first fruit belongs to God, 
as a parent, that child will know what is right and what is wrong. That's raising them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. It's not legalism, it's a heart attitude, and they will see the heart attitude. Where your treasure is, your heart is also. The vision, where there's no revelation, no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. It's your job as parents and amongst these witnesses, and these witnesses here, as well as the congregation, are to mention it to them. You have the right to say, are you setting the proper example for your children? I remember when you dedicated that child and you made a commitment. What are you doing now? Hmm? Peers should have that influence. We're in the same family. Eldership. If you go home and you have roast pastor, <laughs> uh, speaking this for my benefit at this point, uh, <laughs> You go home and you have roast pastor, your children see that, don't expect them to respect authority because they're using you as a model. And if you don't, they will take it even further than you do. So basically those five heart attitudes, attendance, the attitude of serving, the heart attitude toward giving, the heart attitude toward the vision of the family or the vision of the house. And Jennifer's gonna cover some of that uh, a little bit. And eldership, authority. You want these children that are raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord to respect their boss, whether they got a good boss or a bad boss. You want them to be able to function in the marketplace in a healthy way and grow up to be. But you set the example as parents. Are you still willing to commit? <laughs> okay, then. Are you willing to call them on these things when they don't? Then let me have Landon. Then just as Hannah brought young Samuel and dedicated him to the Lord, we lift up this child and we do dedicate and consecrate him. And he is going to be one like a John who is going to have a silent intimacy with God that's going to be above his peers. And I just hear the Lord saying that that which I've begun in him and in his family's family, that he's going to carry a convergence of anointings that's going to be increased and multiplied. And he is going to be like John the Beloved. He is going to be one so close to the heart of God that people are going to be attracted to him like a magnet. He's going to cause, he's going to cause that magnetism to draw many unto him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 And upon that dedication, we return them to your stewardship, which includes everything. Now, those of you in the congregation, will you stand with us, please, as a demonstration of your commitment to them and join us in prayer. Father of all life, we thank you for the life now dedicated to your love and care. We pray that your mercies will follow Landon all the days of his life. Bless these parents and help them to remain faithful to the commitments and promises made this day to you on behalf of their child as witnessed by this congregation. Help each of us in this congregation fulfill our responsibility to pray for this child and partner with their parents in providing the kind of environment that will bless them and lead them to, to a meaningful faith in Jesus. Just extend a hand and just release loving intercession in behalf of, of Landon that he would walk in the ways of God and that the prayers of the saints would go forward and confirm every good thing that was predestined in him before the foundation of the earth, that he would walk in those works. In Jesus' name, amen. And we pray in the name of the one who said, allow the little children to come unto me in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Yes. And we're going to anoint... We're going to anoint Landon with this oil. You've all heard the story about this oil? Nod your head if you've heard the story. Okay, everybody's heard the story of this oil. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just anoint him for the life. <laughs> He's got a Holy Spirit unction on him now. And I just believe that, by the, that even as a young child, that he's going to go to his father and just like, just like young Samuel end up going to, lead, to Eli, uh, Eli I, I hear the voice of the Lord, Dad. Just as Jason did to me at the age of probably five, he was coming to me and hearing the voice of God and God was speaking to him. And Haven too. Amen. 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 <laughs> on Father's Day and of all things, the Lord laid a father's message on my heart. Uh -huh. Who'd have thought? 
Huh? That does not necessarily that does happen. Not necessarily that, that, happen. That, uh, the message coincides with holidays or other special days. But, but uh, Jennifer and I wanted just, just to share some things because I believe the revelation that is coming forth in this day and age is going to be a deeper revelation of the Father. And we've had in times past historically the revelation of, of Jesus. We have the revelation of the Holy Spirit at the turn of the century in a significant way. But I believe the next unfolding is going to be a deeper, richer, especially to a fatherless generation. What better revelation, right, of a loving father. Not, I don't know what kind of father you had growing up, but I'll tell you what. You need to know God the Father by the Spirit. Amen. He's better than the best of them. And you need that perspective to live a healthy Christian life. I believe that it's helpful to understand what uh, fathering was all about during the lifetime of Jesus and in the Bible. And at that time, it was all about a father and his family. And this is the way we need to come to see our Father God, the same way Jesus saw Father God, and we need to remove any barriers to our earthly fathers that pre prevent us from seeing God the Father as He really is. Now, Jewish families lived in family housing complexes or units called insulae, or single, uh, that is insula, multi-generational extended family. So they would be on the grounds and there would be multiple dwelling places and as new members were added to the family, they could add rooms onto the houses or build more houses. Now, so our New Testament term household, the household of faith, the household of God, means an extended family living together. And the family was termed bet av, meaning the house of the father. And when Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions or dwelling places, this is what he was referring to. And he was not referring to heaven. He was referring to a quality of life with our father that we could experience right now on planet earth. To found a family was idiomatically to build a house. The bait house was a subdivision of the Mishpaka family in the larger sense. And generally there was a common uh, way of making a living that was common to the family members and they would participate in the family business or the family trade. Now, in Jewish history and tradition, the family is considered to be the most important institution for shaping ethnic and religious identity and transmitting the values and truths of Judaism. Now, the father, of course, was the head of the family unit and the owner of the property. He was the authority and, yes, commanding. However, so much more than that. He was expected to be benevolent, generous, to show open-hearted love to his family, and also compassion. The patriarchal blessing carried legal force, by the way, with the regard to the distribution of um, privileges and inheritances, and the father was required to circumcise his son to redeem him as the firstborn and assure that he marries, teach him the Torah, and also teach him a trade. So the son would follow in the footsteps of the father. Now the Hebrew system of education is so different from what we know where you go to school and you learn information. The father was the one responsible for teaching his sons. The scriptural model of education and the goal for the student is to become what the teacher is. Knowledge, of course, is acquired as a byproduct, but the goal is to shape the character, the inner person, the heart. And incidentally, the family and the synagogue are the only two institutions referred to in traditional Jewish literature as a sanctuary in miniature. Now Joseph 
the earthly father of Jesus, was called a tecton. This means carpenter, but not in the sense of somebody who would do woodworking. So those pictures you've seen of Joseph and Jesus in this little dirt floor place um, making tables and chairs is not accurate. In the Gospels, the word tecton, T-E-K-T-O-N, is used to describe Joseph's line of work. A tecton means a carpenter who builds, not just an ordinary carpenter. A tecton would generally work as a stonemason because the main building materials of the day were not wood. There was local limestone and imported marble. So the eldest son would be expected to take over the family business someday. So what would Jesus have needed to learn? He would have needed to learn with teams of people. He would have needed to learn uh, instructing artisans, overseeing mosaics and tiles, as well as the general um, building of a structure. And it's probable that Jesus and his brothers worked with Joseph to construct their own family home. Now, how, if the scriptures make a lot more sense with that understanding, because a tecton would have known that you don't build a house on sand, you build it on, build it on solid bedrock so that it will stand the floods and the winds that come. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said, a wise man builds his house on the rock. And of course, we know that the rock in the spirit refers to the rock of Jesus. In Matthew 16, 17, Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. And 1 Peter 4, 2 through 5, we come to him as living stones, so he can set us in place. It's Jesus who builds his church, so he can set us in place, so that he can align us with himself and align us properly with one another to make the household of God. And even Ephesians 2.22, prepare us that we would become a dwelling place so Father God can come and rest in our midst with his glory and his power. Add the part about the, uh, uh, the reason that some people would think that uh, the sons are getting preeminence over the daughters. There's a reason oh. for that. Oh, well, in, at, at the time of Jesus, it was generally the sons who would stay home and be part of the family. They would prepare a place and bring their bride to come and live in the insula of the family. So the sons were permanent. We say in our culture, uh, I don't know if you've heard it said, a uh, son is a son till he takes, his, uh, takes a wife, but a daughter's a daughter the rest of her life. Well, in this case, it was the son who remained part of the original family unit, and the daughters would marry and move to the household of their husbands. So the place of a son was very important. Now, in Scripture, we are to be the bride of Christ, referring to our personal intimacy, but we're also called to be sons. All of us is overcoming sons. Now, Dennis mentioned that in this next awakening, we believe there's going to be a revelation of the Father such as the church and the world has never seen before. And we need to understand that God's eternal purpose is to have a bride and have these sons. And as a matter of fact, Paul in the book of Ephesians Praise a prayer having to do with the inheritance of Father God. We know we have an inheritance in Jesus, but Father God has an inheritance in us. And Paul prays in Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 20. I, Paul, heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, and do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, 
may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Father, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of the Father's inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the same measure of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So Paul longed for the Ephesian Christians to really know, know in their spirits, know as a real experience, not just know as information, but come to know it in the depths of their being in reality, knowing God the Father deeply and intimately, and the calling to be worthy sons of the Father, his inheritance, and the greatness of his power that we've already received that worked in Christ and will work in us when we see what he has given to us. Now, the Father's eternal purpose is to have a family made up of overcoming sons. And we know with all things um, that there's, there will be a remnant who will move into the fullness of this, but God the Father's plan is related to sons. Galatians 4, 6, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Hebrews 2.10, it was fitting for Father God, to whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto his glory to make the captain of, the, of their salvation perfect first. Jesus was the captain. He went ahead. He prepared a way as the firstborn son to make a way to take many sons to the Father. In other words, to have many sons who are like God, who have his heart of giving to others and loving others. Father God wanted nothing for himself. It was all about giving that he loved so much that he gave his only son for us to have that heart that heart, to have many sons who are like God, who share his heart just as Jesus was like God. Romans eight twenty nine, Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in many sons, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. When the working out of God's plan is completed, there will be many sons restored to the original glory found in the garden. And I encourage you to go back and read John 14, chapter 14 again with fresh eyes, because it starts out, in my father's house, in my father's household, there's room for all my children. And then Jesus tells us the way. It's by not having the spirit of the world that we once had, the spirit of sin, the spirit of sin and death working in us, but a new spirit, the spirit of God the Father's Son in us. He said, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for us. And he did that in his death, burial, and resurrection, in which he took our old man, our old unclean spirit, to death with him on the cross, that now, by faith, we might receive his spirit and also the spirit of his Father, because spirits can interpenetrate. We can be one with the Father and one with Jesus, and actually in the Spirit we can be one with one another in one accord. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. We are seated together with him in the heavenly places 
on the right hand of Father God with Jesus. And then Jesus went on to say, explaining to his disciples, he said, the Father who dwells in me does the works. It was the Father working through Jesus to display his power and glory in the signs and wonders and mighty miracles. And Jesus said, I wasn't doing it. It was the Spirit of my Father in me, demonstrating who he is to the world. Believe, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works. Most assuredly, I say to you, that he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And then Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home within him. This, is, this will be the Father's revival, the Father's awakening, knowing the Father, coming into that place of intimacy with him. And these sons that God is preparing are Father God's inheritance. And I do believe that when the outpouring comes and these sons are raised up, it's going to change the whole world. And all God wants, says in Romans 12, 2, therefore, are you willing? Catherine Kuhlman said it will cost you everything, but then I really didn't have much anyway. <laughs> For those who are willing, Romans 12, 2, and Paul says, therefore, present yourself a living sacrifice to God that he may claim his inheritance, which is you. First John. In First John, the epistle. John speaks to three people groups. He says, I speak to you little children, I speak to you young men, and I speak to you fathers who've known him who's from the beginning. And when I was a young Christian uh, and I was anxious to go to Bible school, right off the bat, God said, no, I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit. And it was uh, troublesome for me because I wanted to. And as soon as I submitted to that, now 40 some years later, I look back and that was the best years of my life is when he took me. And here's something, if you're a note taker, I want, we are a how-to people and I can literally see the outline of what God wants to do to bring children to young, graduate to the young man, young woman, to the place of mothers and fathers mature enough to handle the harvest turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers. There's going to have to be strong, mature leaders. And here was the process. Now, this is all relational. This is not a method. This is not a model. But this was an experience that if you were to apply that, no matter where you're at, you will see the fruit. God says, I'm not going to, for me anyway, he said, I'm not going to give you a truth that I'm not going to teach you how to cultivate that truth, that I'm not going to then, in fact, ask you to be honest with yourself, is there fruit from that truth, or do you just know it? And here's, here's the big picture. He showed me that I'm going to teach you to be intimate with me, and you're going to know my touch. All right? Everybody should welcome the touch of God experientially, not theoretically, experientially, knowing the touch of God, but then that touch will move in intermittent stages until it's an embrace. So if you're a note taker, write this down and, and challenge your relationship with Jesus toward intimacy to say, do I just experience an occasional touch with him, an intermittent thing, or have I entered into the embrace? The embrace means that there is a, a, an awareness of his presence even in the mundane activities of life. Then, thirdly, this is something that you will determine in your own heart. Thirdly, it's from that place of embrace, there is a surprising thing happening, and this is very necessary for those caught up in any addictive behaviors, because this is part of the solution. You will find a satisfaction in that embrace. You elongate that embrace, and you will find your place, a satisfaction that you cannot define with words, because it's an experience in Jesus and in Him alone. 
It's an experience of satisfaction. It is the opposite of all addictions, which are insatiable. They're never satisfied. You always need more, but it's never satisfying. You move from the touch. I'm going to give this to you because I want you to take notes on this. I want to challenge you to intimacy with God. I don't care what your giftings are. Your intimacy with God has to increase. First, touch. Second, embrace. This is a progression. That embrace leads to satisfaction. And from the satisfaction, there is enough of a death to self. In other words, you've, you've discovered him as your exceedingly great reward. And it's suddenly not about you anymore. It's not even who I am in Christ. That's the way some people teach identity. Who am I in Christ? The, the I is too big. <laughs> it's supposed to be who am I in Christ. In, in Him I live and move and have my being. That needs to be the attitude. But when does that happen? From the place of satisfaction, it points to overflowing love that Jennifer was talking about. You start without trying you become others-oriented, and the needs of others are more important than your own. You can't work that up with willpower. You work that up out of a heart attitude and out of a satisfaction. It's like the sons of Zadok. Uh, they didn't get any inheritance other than him, and they could draw near to him, and that was satisfaction. They were satisfied in that. Those were the ones that he caused to teach and to discern because they're in that place. Satisfaction points to an overflowing love. You with me so far? So what's it point to? Overflowing or abounding love, Philippians 1, 8, 9 in that area. Let your love abound yet more and more in all real discernment, real knowledge and real discernment. Okay, you got, you're with me still? Abounding love? This is a relationship now. This is not a formula. All right? And then while you're all of a sudden, you're others-oriented, there's a place to where it's Jesus overflowing, giving direction, perception, leadings, guidings. You're fulfilled without sweating. Remember the sons of Zadok were to perform and wear linen, nothing that caused sweat. Ministry should not cause sweat. If you're, in, if you're doing ministry and it's causing sweat other than a hot room, <laughs> you're probably doing it too much in the flesh. That overflowing love points Listen to this. It points to the heart of the Father. If you continue on that journey, and that overflowing, abounding love points to the heart of the Father, and if that heart is in you, what is going to be the end result? You're going to be participating with the heart of the Father, bringing many sons unto maturity, unto glory. Isn't that the ultimate purpose? That goes from history past. He was a father before he was a creator of God, before he was a miracle worker. He was a father. And what is it in eternity past? What did Jesus say? I go to my Abba and your Abba. But that he was the firstborn among many brethren to bring many sons unto glory. You want to know what your ministry is? If you don't see that big picture, and if that's not the overarching purpose above your specific callings, then you're missing the boat, even with your specific callings, because that is the ultimate calling. How much reproducing? I, I sympathize. If a, I have no comprehension. The only other ministry that I understand is the evangelist who has fruit that is identifiable. I... I couldn't imagine teaching and not seeing changed lives. I probably would be very disillusion with teaching. Because my model, I believe, is more the biblical model. The model was live it before you teach it. Make it your experience before you give it. It's not the Greek model. The Greek model is you could be a teenager. And if you mastered the material, you were a teacher with no life experience. And probably none of it was working in their own life. We don't need to be an echo. We need to be the voice of God. And you have to own it to be the voice. Though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many fathers. And I believe on Father's Day, that's something you should look for. I still re remarkable at that physician here in, uh, that was telling me the story how when he came from Nigeria, was it? He came from Nigeria, he goes, he's going, he went to his pastor 
who was a father to him, and he says, where do I go to church when I go to America? He said, don't look for a church, look for a father. That was the wisdom that came from a true mentor and a true father. Though you have 10,000, and you know what the real word is there? Though you have 10,000 boy leaders, you don't have many fathers. And God's basically saying that that overarching purpose, he showed me that all the people that were free got deliverance and then moved forward and upward in their closeness to God, followed in their own life those, those elements that I gave you. Because getting deliverance is instant, but the relationship that you maintain afterward is where the transformation comes. Forgiveness and repentance are instant. Restoration is a process. And if you're going to grow and, and be complete. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to close with the way God taught me. Well, let me say this. When I said the first thing he taught me in the school of the Spirit, that every place in the Bible where you see his name, that there is a corresponding nature that matches. And I wanted to be a partaker of the divine nature. I didn't want to memorize names. They can do that in Bible school. Teach you all the names of God. You memorize all the names of God and uh, there's no resemblance of any of those attributes in your own life, <laughs> then it's just memorization. But I hungered and I said, ah, that I might know him, that I might progressively, this was my railroad track scripture, Philippians 3.10 in the Amplified, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood. And that I wanted him to flash with reality on my heart through the face of Jesus Christ, the various attributes and names of God. Because name meant nature, and I didn't want a name, I wanted the nature that matched that name. So I'm gonna kinda close with this. This is just from my own school of the spirit. I did, I did everything I could find. I did, the Lord is the captain of my salvation, my elder brother, I did it with uh, the king of kings, I did it with being a subject to the king, I did, it. I did it in every relationship and character attribute that I could find in the scriptures over a period of 10 years. I even had one person left my church later when I pastored because I spent a whole year on Jehovah my apostle, Jehovah my prophet. I did 52 messages in a row on the names of God and how to live it out, cultivate it. And one guy goes, if I hear another Jehovah message, I'm out of here. <laughs> of course, there was very little change in his life too. And we're talking change, 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 not information. So I'm just going to give you the four that were kind of four faces of the Father. And I want you to pray right now, but I want you to open up your spirit and say, I want to cultivate that relationship. Okay. Now there's, like I said, there's many names and every name has a nature. I want to have that nature imparted to me to where it's a deposit, to where it resides in me, to where I am a partaker of it, where it's an engrafted word, where it's written on the tablet of my heart, not in my head. All right. I want to own it. I want to be owned and known by him. And so do you. All right. So here's the first one. Elohim. First face of the Father. Elohim is the creator God. He's a covenant-making God. And I saw that in this, that he was 100% total power and might, total sovereignty. And oh, I hunger. I'm in covenant with the God of all power. If I've got him, I've got everything. And I would bask in the presence of Elohim, the creator, and all creativity would flow out of him. If I didn't know the answer, I could have cared less because I would just simply say, God, you're the God of all creativity. Creativity is a product of my human spirit. Flow out of me. You're a creator God. You can do what I can't do. And he would bring things to pass. I used to get tired of even having my own plans. A, B, C, and then God had come along. I would submit to him and it would be none of the above. I'm going to do it this way. Until I finally just quit having all of those so-called plans of doing it my way and just saying, God, what are we going to do today? How are you going to work that out? It was response to the creator God, and I'm a, he's a covenant-making God, and by golly, I knew. I was even, as a baby Christian, I was a little upset with those promise boxes because I'm learning Elohim, a covenant-making God, and he says, if you do this, then as I do that. And those promise boxes were just promises. We need some covenant boxes for Elohim to reveal himself through Jesus. I wanted to know that aspect of my God. And so Elohim, he makes covenants with his creation. He, he, he's basically complete creativity. And it's kind of like if you looked at the Godhead, uh, this is maybe, this is just for, 
for me, it was kind of a picture. But God was the architect in his creativity. Jesus, the wise master builder. And the Holy Spirit whoosh, breathed the breath of life into the structure and made it alive so it wasn't dead. And it was just like all three of them, the architect, the wise master builder. God had a plan for my life. There was a, there was a plan, a blueprint. Jesus was going to fulfill that blueprint in my life by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can say it that way as well. That's Elohim. Don't you want to know him? Oh, then, then you just soak in the presence that this aspect of Jesus, I want to know that creator God. I want to know that, that God who has a plan and a, 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 for my life, and I want him to build it in me. For the Lord said, I will build my church. Not you. You don't build it. I will build my church. All right, I'm going to do these kind of quickly because this is nowhere near the, what I did. I would spend days and weeks on one name and bask in it, what you would call soaking. And I would just soak in it until I knew I had a measure of it. So, I own this thing. And then I would look for the fruit to prove to myself because this is the way God taught me in the school of the Spirit. It's not about learning in your head. It's basically I'm going to do three things. You got to write this down too. First of all, I'm going to give you a revelation. That revelation isn't for information. That revelation, although there, it includes information, that revelation is for transformation. I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that. And you're going to have to be patient in cultivating it because it's not instant. Oh, it's not instant. I want instant. Yeah. You can get some instant things, but maturity is never instant. Character development is never instant. I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that, and then I'm going to ask you, Dennis, to humble yourself and look in hindsight and say, did it work? Have you seen it affect the change in your life? That's a healthy way, that's a healthy introspection, right? Because then you're, you're basically evaluating whether God's doing a work in you or you're just uh, learning more information, learning and learning, but never coming to a real knowledge of the truth. All right, the second one, Jehovah. Jehovah, you know, you know how many Jehovah names there are with specificity. I did all of them. But in general, I wanted God to be in me in this nature. And Jehovah was the revealing one. Oh, I fell in love with just that statement. He is the revealing one. He reveals himself as Jehovah Nisi, a Jehovah, all right? He's a revealing one. And in revealing himself to me, I saw a truth that is pretty foundational. The truth in knowing him as the revealing one, being was more important than doing. That's not a small truth. That's a truth you can understand in your head, but if you don't live it out, it'll change your whole Christian walk. Being is greater than doing. The doing should flow out of the being, what you are. Out of the overflow of what you are, real ministry comes. And so I saw that, that uh, uh, Jehovah, the revealing one, uh, wherever that name is, he's revealing a character attribute. I am who I am. And thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. And whatever I am you need, he's that. All right? But I saw, too, that in Jehovah, it denoted his unchangeableness, no shadow of turning. You know, we say Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I saw that holiness and righteousness is in that name of Jehovah, that holiness versus sinfulness. And in this day and age, we need that because we're using love the wrong way. Our culture is, is throwing that word love at us when it's unholy. And so, welcoming Jehovah, there is, an, there is a fear of the Lord that's built in with honoring him, that as he reveals himself, he's also revealing his holiness, as well as his love. His love is always attached to it, but it's a holy love. The third name, El Shaddai, uh, the face of the Father. And this one came about rather amusingly, because uh, my intellect was arguing. Do your intellect ever argue with Scripture? Jesus was multiplying the loaves and the fishes, and there were bags left over. And for some crazy reason, it bothered me that there was leftovers. Like, 
the precision. I was looking for a God who was so precise, it would have been the exact amount of fish and the exact amount of fish. Fortunately, that mindset didn't last long because God revealed to me as the El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. And I saw, experienced the extravagant love of the Father whose cup runneth over. And I'm like, oh, that's not waste. That's not miscalculation. That's extravagant love that he has for us. It's an overflowing love. And it just went right inside of me. So sometimes even if you get a question or something look a little fuzzy, you need revelation on anything that's fuzzy in the scriptures. You need something. Pursue it. So El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough, exceedingly abundantly above all that you would ask or think. This is the Father. I'm, I'm preaching the Father. I'm preaching Jesus. But these are aspects of his character, and I'm only giving you a few. I'm just giving you the four big ones that were kind of a starting place for me. All right? So we have uh, the Creator God, the God of 100% power and might and total sovereignty, Elohim. But now we've got Jehovah who wants to reveal himself. Oh, <laughs> that just that he wants to reveal himself. I want to seek him, but he doesn't reveal himself to anybody. He reveals himself to those who diligently seek him as their vital necessity. If it's, it's not a casual walk in the park and hope that it falls out of the sky. It's a, it's a diligent pursuit and God hunger to know him, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. And I saw like an infinite, this will date me a little bit, you ever see a disco ball? You ever see all those little facets of mirrors? I believe for all eternity, even in heaven, we're going to continually have flashes of revelation. And then you're going to go, holy, 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 because it's going to be new. You don't know it all. You haven't arrived yet. There's going to be a continual unfolding of, of his magnificence and his holiness and attributes of his character and his nature. But I said, while I'm here on earth, I want as many of those lights to shine on my heart through the face or facet of Jesus. Right? So I moved on from El Shaddai to probably the most significant one. And to this day, everything we teach has this, Adonai, Lord and Master. That's something that you have to submit to because you can be saved and born again and not walk in lordship. Jesus can be your Savior and not your Lord. You can still pretty much do things the way you want to do it. Everything we teach, let the peace of God rule, is teaching in a practical way how to walk in lordship. And I learned that I didn't lose my salvation, but if I was upset with something in my gut, some person or situation upset me, Jesus spoke to me very lovingly in those initial days and said, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. And it was enough for me to humble myself and say, you know, it's really not that important. You know, really the things that bother you are really not that big a deal in the light of eternity, in the light of what God wants to do in your life and for you. Those issues are small issues compared to the glory that, that he wants to reveal. So I say, Adonai is total commitment. I want to be father-possessed. I want to be father-owned. And I want to pray even now because I know, having traveled church to church for 12 years, I saw that there are people in the body of Christ for years who can't even handle the word father. I don't know what your father was like growing up, but I'll tell you what. You could have had the best or the worst, but it's nothing like God the Father. And you need to know experientially what he is like for you. Many have been orphaned. And I believe that there are people like Moses setting adrift uh, down a winding river. His little spirit probably felt the rejection, but God's got a plan. I am was with him. And every time someone made an excuse, God gave the same answer throughout Scripture, whether it was Jeremiah, Moses. He says, I am with you. And if I am with you, don't worry about that other stuff. You can't talk, you're too young blah, 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 all your excuses. you got to die to excuses because God is going to cleanse and start over. How many want to start over? You know the first place we have to start over before you're going to really get a father's blessing? You're going to have to start by forgiving your natural father. 
and you'll say, I can't think of anything to forgive. You've got 2,000 thought patterns up here. You let God search the heart down to the 400 billion non-conscious. That's why David says, search me, O God, for secret faults. That was because they were secret to David. You don't know everything, so don't go, I can't think of anybody. You go to prayer and you let God pick the cherries. You let God show you what you need. You let him search the heart. Don't be self-searched. That's navel staring. Be a God-searched person and say, God, let's do it right now. Because before you're going to get a father's blessing, I'll tell you what, you're going to have to release forgiveness to them. That doesn't get them off the hook. That doesn't mean what they did was right. It simply means it frees you from the pain. Real forgiveness, that's a supernatural transaction, takes the pain so that you can remember something unpleasant without the pain. That's what our Jesus does for you. He takes your pain and he takes your sorrow. If that hasn't happened, you only did it with the intellect. That's not forgiveness. Real forgiveness, he takes the pain. Are you ready for that? There's a nice anointing in here right now for that. I want you to close your eyes and say, God, search my heart for any mentor, authority figure, father, stepfather, lack of father, any judgment that I've made toward men. And the first person that comes up, allow yourself down in the gut to feel that uncomfortableness. There's a queasiness or a feeling I can't even describe, but it's not the peace of God when I think of that Father. I let, I allow Jesus in me, the forgiver. I yield down in my gut I relax and open the door and I let Jesus go to it and carry it away out of my belly flows loving forgiveness. And how do I know if it happened? Anybody? How do I know? Peace. God will not play spiritual games. He will not put peace on a lie. He's the spirit of truth. If it changes to peace, then the heavenly record, look where I'm pointing. This is the heavenly record. You have peace and you feel clean here. It's clean in heaven. You'll have a memory of it for reproof, for correction, and you don't want to do that again. He doesn't erase the historical record. He erases the heavenly record through that gift of forgiveness and repentance. And there's never been a move of God without a move of repentance. And I want you to start ahead by forgiving fathers, removing any roadblocks to the father's outpouring upon your life. You agree? Released forgiveness to your father? Are you ready? Okay. Now, how many men in here never heard an affirming word through a male voice? Anybody? The last time I prayed this many years ago, my father came forward. And I prayed a father's blessing on my own father. My grandfather never said a kind word to him all the days of his life. Some never had that. Most of you had, I've hoped. But right now, I'm going to pray. And I want to anoint you with oil. Sons and daughters, I want you to come forward. I want to anoint you with oil and pray a father's blessing over you. To literally infuse you with the love of God that you've made room for today. All right? Can I have some of my pastors come up too? You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. 
you will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.